want you to uh, take a look this morning at the Gospel of John. We are beginning a series of messages that will take us through the uh, Gospel. Um, my hope is to uh, touch on the major themes of the Gospel, but not get too far bogged down into the Gospel, because you could spend years going through this uh, wonderful account. This morning we'll pick up our reading in the first chapter at verse 6 and read through verse 18. Last week we looked at the first 13 verses of the chapter and our message this morning will focus mostly on verses 14 through 18. This is an introduction to the gospel. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. And from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, He has made Him known. Let's pray. Father, we thank You that we might gather before You and await the work of Your Spirit in our hearts, illuminating our minds to understand the truth of the Scriptures and to see the glory of Jesus, the Word of God. We pray that as we turn our hearts to your word this morning, that you would give us hearts that are filled with faith, ready to receive that which you have to say. We pray that you grant clarity to your word and power, and we pray that you will be glorified in our midst. We thank you for your word in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the great preachers of the, uh, recent church history was the London uh, Baptist Charles Spurgeon, he preached it towards the latter part of the 1800s and had packed out uh, churches for years upon years. His sermons were uh, printed and published and spread all across the world at that time, the late 1800s. They would come here to the United States and be published here as well. People were listening to what Charles Spurgeon had to say. He wrote a book to the students in his college. He was a very, uh, not only a, a tremendous preacher and pastor of a, a large, flourishing church, but he also maintained a college for students in the ministry who wished to become effective preachers of the word. And who else would you want to listen to than Charles Spurgeon about how to preach effectively? And so his lectures on that, which are amazing lectures filled with such insight and uh, a mind that is unfathomable in the way that he calls all kinds of church history stories and uh, all kinds of things and pulls it all together. Um, in, in the course of his lectures to my students, towards the end of his uh, discussions there, he talks about the importance of illustrations and anecdotes and stories for the preacher. And the idea is that an illustration serves as a window for the congregation so that through the story, through the illustration, 
The congregation can feel something of what the truth is. The congregation can understand it in a, in a better way. Sometimes people learn in different ways. Some are more inclined to abstract concepts. Others are more concerned to learn things with their hands by working and doing things. And others are impressed by visual images. And uh, Spurgeon here seeks to address the whole man in all the ways in which we hear the gospel and illustrations and stories and anecdotes and these kinds of things, parables, um, are means by which we can see the glory of the word of God and understand it in powerful ways. What we have in what John says here is something more than just an illustration, but it is at least that much. What John says here is that the Word became flesh. It was embodied before the people of God. John would say in the opening of his epistle that that which we have seen, that which we have heard, that which our hands have handled of the Word of God, this is what we proclaim to you. This was a real man, John says. And when he begins in this section here in verse 14 to say that the Word became flesh, he uses a very striking and powerful description of Jesus in his day, particularly uh, in the area around Ephesus where he likely had his ministry for at least some time. Uh, there was a, a, a pre-Gnostic uh, point of view developing that had uh, a separation. Everything that was of true and of value was spiritual, intellectual. It was light. But the things of the flesh and the body, that was weak and corrupt and uh, not to be valued. And so when John says that this word of God, which begins this chapter, is the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who is uh, in the presence of God, is focused on God, who is God. So we have an, an intimation of the Trinity there. He says this word became flesh. He didn't just simply say he became a man, but he took that word which was the most <clears throat> difficult for the pre-Gnostics of his day. Flesh. You mean his body? This blood and bones and skin and this tattered container which contains our soul? Jesus became flesh. That's exactly what happened. He took on our flesh. Now, We'll talk in a moment about what all that means, but at the very least, he's saying there was a real man standing before the, the people there. And so if you wish to understand God and have his word communicated to you, what God has done for us is, that, as it were, stoop down to us, to our level. As a parent stoops down to his child and explains in language that the child can understand, this is God. And Jesus, being the Word of God, comes in human flesh to reveal God to us. So that if we wish to know God, we must know Him through His illustration. Jesus, who is the exact representation of His nature, as the writer of the Hebrews says in the first chapter. The exact imprint, the, um, uh, the, the glory of the sun's rays, the radiance of the sun's light. That is Jesus Christ. He is the Word that was made flesh. Now, when we first look at that language, the Word became flesh, we're right away wondering, what does it mean that He became flesh? How did He become flesh? And over the centuries, the church, has, especially in the early centuries of the church, the church was struggling to understand, what does this mean? Word becoming flesh. And there were those who, uh, you know, Satan is always active and is sowing seeds of uh, heresy and falsehood into the church. And in the early days, there were a number of those who were twisting what the scriptures had to say. Now, the language here is very general. He became flesh. But through the rest of scriptures, we determine what exactly that means. Now, there was one fellow by the name of Apollinaris who described this union of, of God with flesh, uh, of the Word with flesh, as um, 
just really the flesh as we're being a container for the word of God. And there's no human soul, no human personality at all. It was just the word of God there walking around in human flesh. So that was one description that the church rejected. Because that diminishes the humanity of Jesus. If he's just merely flesh. <clears throat> Calvin will point out very accurately that the uh, use of the term flesh by John here is not to limit our understanding of Jesus' human nature just to his flesh. But that flesh is a part for the whole. and includes his whole nature, his whole human nature, including his mind, his emotions, and his will. So the church rejected that notion by Apollinaris. But then the others would rise up in the church and have different points of view. Nestorius came into the church history, and Nestorius said, well, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, but the flesh was fully human. And so what you have here is the person of Jesus and the person of the word. And so you have the two natures in Jesus, but also two persons. So you have the heresy Nestorianism. If you ever want to make a name for yourself, promote a heresy, and they'll name the heresy after you, Clarinism or something like that. Hopefully I'll avoid that kind of thing. <laughs> but Nestorianism taught that there were two persons to Jesus, God and the human person. And he could not conceive of how that humanity would be without a human person. Well, if you just look at what John has to say here, it's quite apparent that there's only one person that he's speaking of. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. Third person singular, if I remember my English. Um, a singular person there, His glory. And go on to identify Him as Jesus Christ. It's not their glory, the glory of the Word, and the glory of Jesus, this person who is somehow innocent and free of sin, but it is His glory. Well, we could go further down the road of church history and explore various options, but you can see the challenges that the church faced in understanding how does the Word become flesh and what does that mean? And in brief, the church has come up with a formula which says that the, the divinity and the humanity of Christ are not confused, mixed together in some way, so it's part God, part man, they're not blended together so that he's a third thing, this kind of um, morph of divinity and humanity. He's not two separate beings, as in Nestorianism. Uh, and, and so he is one person and two natures, fully God and fully man. And John's word here is that the word became flesh. And it's a, a, a sign of his great humility that he took on that flesh for us so that he might reveal God to us. Now, as John goes through this, uh, he, he makes it clear that... I lost my place. He makes it clear that uh, this flesh dwelt among us. And the, the language here of dwelling among us, if you are into the Greek language at all, is this idea of uh, tabernacling among us. He dwelt in a tent, as it were, among us. And John purposefully uses this phrase as he does a, a variety of other things, especially here in talking about the glory, we beheld his glory. And the, he's bringing us back to the Exodus account. Remember when Moses led Israel out of Egypt, they came into the wilderness. And God instructed them to build a tabernacle. And they built this tabernacle, the holy place and the most holy place, and the labor and the altar and so forth. And when it was finished, what happened? Well, the Shekinah glory, the glory cloud, came and settled in the most holy place. And so what John does, he says that Jesus, the Word of God, is this one who tabernacles among us. Tabernacle was a bit of a temporary arrangement, right? Eventually it would become a temple, and Solomon would similarly build the temple, and then the glory cloud would come down upon that temple in a marvelous way. I think it's first Kings chapter 8. Look at that. And, and then Ezekiel the, the prophet sees the glory of God actually.
actually departing from the temple because of the judgment on Israel. But here, John says, we beheld his glory, this one who tabernacled among us. Jesus is one who's bringing to the church a second exodus. And John is going to often make use of themes that are come out of that exodus event to give us a view of Jesus, an illustration of what he came to do for us. And so just as there was an exodus out of Egypt for Israel of old, Jesus does something greater than that. He brings or inaugurates an exodus out of sin and out of the kingdom of darkness and brings us into the kingdom of God. Jesus will be, as we'll see in a moment, one who is even greater than Moses. And he ushered in a, a, a period of time which is greater than that under the law. Surely this is one to whom we should give our utmost attention. The word became flesh and dwelled among us. We beheld his glory, glory as of the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so as John looks at Jesus, he sees this one who is unique in all of history and time. He is the only son of the Father, separate from the rest of us. He's not just one child among many, but he is the unique son of God. As we saw last week, as the word of God, he is one who stood prior to the creation. And everything that exists came through Jesus. And so this one is God in the flesh. And he is the only son of the Father. He bears this unique relationship to God. Uh, I don't want to get into the details of the particular translations, but some of you will note that there's the idea of the only begotten. And uh, Modern translation is the only son or the one and only son. Uh, there's not a difference in the Greek text underlying that all modern and ancient translations are using the same translation or the same Greek text underlying that. The difference is understanding the meaning of the words. And the uh, word uh, is monogenes in the Greek language for, uh, as the older translations say, the only begotten, or more recent translations, the, the only son the one and only, or the unique one. I like the idea of uniqueness. He is the unique son. Because that distinguishes him from those of us who become children of God through faith. Jesus is unique. Um, I get too technical here. But there are different Greek words that underline, or uh, there was, if you will, mistake made by the older translators in determining the only begotten. Uh, that's going to get too complicated for our sermon here, so let's, let me just put it that way. And, and it, it, the idea is of the uniqueness of the Son. Now, in one way or the other, it's the same concept, is it not? Only Son, begotten, the only begotten. Jesus bears a relationship to the Father as Son to the Father. And he's the only one who has that particular unique relationship. As John will describe it in a moment later, he is at the Father's side, or literally he is in the Father's bosom. He's at his side, or at his breast. And this reminds me of the Apostle John as he uh, was with Jesus at the Last Supper and he reclined against his, his chest. Uh, he was one whom Jesus loved, as the Gospel goes on to say. Jesus was in the bosom of the Father. That is, he was in the closest possible relationship to the Father. And it was a relationship of intimate, full, and complete love. Jesus, the only Son of the Father, has this relationship with God the Father. And it's essential for us to see this of Jesus as the Word of God who is with God so that we might listen to what the Word has to say to us about God the Father. His mission, if you will, was that of revealing God to us. At the end of this section, John uses a very familiar word to us, and at least those of us who are interested in preaching. He says that the Son, Jesus, is the one who 
explains the Father to us. And more literally, in, in the Greek, it's Jesus is the one who exegetes the Father to us. The Greek word is the word that we get exegete from. When your pastor takes a text of scripture, he explains the meaning of that text. He exegetes it. He takes what it says and explains it to you, breaks it down, so brings light to it from other scriptures, hopefully, and reveals that message to you. Jesus is one who exegetes God to us. We would not know God except God freely revealed himself to us. And this he has done through his son, the word, Jesus. So if we wish to know the true God, we must do so through the one that he set aside to communicate to us, Jesus Christ. He, and he alone, is the word of God. And so Jesus exegetes God for us. And what does he say? Well, John pulls together a couple words here that are, are vital for us to appreciate the gospel message. He says, Jesus came full of grace and truth. Grace and truth. This is what he is revealing of the Father. God is one who brings us grace and truth. Grace is that unmatched favor of God that he freely expresses to those to whom he wills. He has favor upon some and sets them free from their sins and brings them into his family. This is grace. As John goes on to say, we have in Jesus grace upon grace, or one grace after the other. There is such a fullness of revelation of grace to us. It's as though once you receive one element of God's grace, you haven't exhausted the grace of God, but there's more, and there's more, and there's more. We read in the Psalms, his loving kindness, his mercies are new each morning. Did you not feel that even just today? I stepped outside to take my dogs for a walk. <laughs> One went with me, the other was getting old and put it back in the house. He couldn't walk much. But I'm walking out at about 6.30 in the morning. And the roads are quiet, the sun is up off the horizon, there's a mist over the field, trees off on the horizon, fresh scent of the grass there, and it was just a wonderful moment. Fresh grace in God's revelation of Himself. But truly, each breath we breathe, each step we take, each moment of life is a revelation of grace. We live merely by the grace of God. God doesn't owe us an existence. In fact, if God were to be just, and sometimes we want, give us justice! Well, we don't quite want justice in all of its many facets. It's by the grace of God we live each day. And if you understand that, my, doesn't that change your outlook on things? One day after the other, God is showing you Grace. It's certainly been fulfilled fully in Jesus Christ and the freeness of salvation that we have in Him, the abundance of life that John will speak of here. Here is grace, so great that the greatest of sinners, the Apostle Paul, as he describes himself, could find grace from God and have his sins taken away. All his sins removed. Here is grace. Do you know that grace? Have you felt it in your heart? Have you felt the washing away of your sins? Being made new and alive in Christ. This is grace. And John says, one grace after the other just piles up and piles up, on and on and on. It is an inexhaustible supply of grace that will expand throughout all of eternity. Full of grace. Of his fullness, we have all received one grace after the other. And then John says that in Jesus is truth. And we've explained this a, a little bit earlier, but Jesus is the one who truly reveals God to us. Remember, 
John chapter 14, the disciples are with Jesus in the upper room, and I think it's Philip asks him, show us the Father, and it's enough. And Jesus says, have I been with you for so long, and you, you, you don't know. He who has seen me has seen the Father. How do you say, show us the Father? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Do you wish to know truth, real truth? Jesus is the embodiment of truth in this person. He is truth. We saw last week that he is life. The fullness of life. The infinite value of life. And similarly, he is truth. Not a speck of lie, not a speck of deception. Fully, purely true. Everything that he says about God, about Christ, about ourselves, about the future, it's all true. He's the truth. And all that he says is true. I think in some ways, John points us to this greater age in which we, in which we stand, where we, we stand at a time of fulfillment. Moses was a period of shadows and types. And so you could say there was truth there under Moses, but it was all under shadow and type. It was kind of a, a picture of what was yet to come, but it wasn't the reality. The writer to the Hebrews reminds us that in Jesus, all these things were fulfilled. He is the truth. These shadows and these types have all passed away. Jesus is the substance of everything that was foreshadowed long ago. He is the truth. And so he ushers in this new age of grace and truth that far surpasses even the law of Moses. Imagine that. Moses has come and God through Moses has revealed law. Law is good, but law can be tough. Law can be very critical. It can be very harsh and demanding. Jesus brings us grace and truth. The revelation of that grace and truth. He is the answer to the law. He is the fulfillment of the law. The law is seen in him and the law is satisfied so that we can have grace and that our minds may be illumined with truth. Christ is that one for us. In conclusion, there was a very sad story this week that I came across uh, on Fox News. Uh, a story of an actor who uh, had been performing for 22 years in a play called Chicago. And uh, after 22 years, the uh, producers and others, I guess, were getting tired of this actor and they wanted to fire him. The problem was that the actor had a clause in his contract whereby he could not be fired. Imagine that. <laughs> so what were they to do? Well, the producers decided to have him come up on stage and practice. Uh, this just occurred recently, June 22nd, I believe. They had him up on the stage and uh, they had him sing the song. And they had him sing it over and over and over again. And each time he sang it, they said, you never get this song right. And they criticized him here, they criticized him there. And they were just making him miserable. You understand what they were doing? It's an old school trick. It's an attempt to make you so miserable that they don't have to fire you, and they couldn't fire him. So they tried to make him so miserable that he just leave and quit. I've had it. I'm out of here. Well, he quit in a different way. He was so upset that he took his life. They weren't expecting that. And now they're being examined for this practice of bullying this particular person. It's not to say that what he did was right in terms of taking his life, but sometimes we face criticisms of all sorts of fashions. People criticize us. Places we get criticized at work, we get criticized in the family, we get criticized in the community. Everybody has something to say. And that's not the, the full extent of it. Even our hearts criticize us. You should have done this, you were wrong to do that. Look at what you've done over here. This is terrible. What's the matter with you? And so we're, we're criticizing ourselves. The law criticizes us. The word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing 
to the dividing of soul and spirit, joint and marrow. You want to talk about criticism. We stand open before the eyes of him with whom we have to do. God sees us perfectly and completely. There's no escape. Where is there relief from such criticism? It's in the grace and truth that is in Jesus Christ. The forgiveness that he brings in the everlasting life. Let's rest in Jesus, the word who became flesh for us, so that we might see this wonderful, glorious illustration of God's grace and truth. Father, we thank you for your word. And we thank you that you have revealed yourself to us through Jesus. We pray that you would bless our hearts, that we would rest in him and enjoy the superabundance of grace that you have for us in him. Wash away our sins, O Lord. Cleanse us from every dark way. Fill us with life, the life that comes to us through Jesus. Make us new in him and help us to live to your glory and praise, overcoming the darkness of life and living as light in the world today. We pray in Jesus' glorious name.